I'd like to start with a story. Addison was an eight-year-old little boy. He was as blonde as could be. He had a quirky sense of humor. He loved to build. He loved Legos. And the other thing he loved was Spider-Man. He loved all things Spider-Man. Addison also was a very thin little boy. He was pale. And he had a cough that literally racked his body. I had never seen or heard anything like it in my life. You see, Addison had cystic fibrosis. And I was his brand new, newly minted nursing student. It was all new to me. Addison had had a good day. So grateful for that. He actually made it to the play playroom. He was able to build some battleships with Legos. He also had all of his treatments for his lungs, for his respiratory system. And he also was able to make it through what I considered like a mini mountain of medication. And he was able to take that with this special applesauce with a lot of extra cinnamon that his mother had made for him. And together, his mother and I helped him get through the day. He had had a lot of activity that day. And he was getting tired. So he needed to rest. So he climbed into his bed. We tucked him in with, of course, the Spider-Man comforter. And he went off to sleep, drifted off to sleep. And I thought to myself, I was so happy for him. He had had a good day. Addison had had a great day. And of course, as the new nursing student, I thought, he had a good day. I had a good day. I breathed a sigh of relief. That was until his mother asked me the question. She simply said to me and asked me, can we talk? Well, I have to tell you, my first thought was, about what? I am, again, I, I, I kept thinking to myself, there's a lot of people in this hospital that know a lot more than I do. I felt so unprepared. I was trained as a doer, you see. I was not, I did not feel particularly comfortable or capable when it came to these kinds of conversations. But I have to tell you, I had the good sense that day to sit down and I basically listened. And Addison's mother went on to tell me some wonderful stories about her son. I felt so privileged to hear them. She told me what she was worried about. She was worried that the medications weren't as effective anymore that it took him longer and longer in the hospital to get better. But she also shared with me her hopes. Of course, she hoped for a cure for cystic fibrosis. And the thing that she was most hopeful for was that Addison's third grade friends would always stick by him, that they would always include him to birthday parties and never leave him out. That was what she hoped for the most. That day, I learned some very important lessons. I learned that, first of all, how important it is to tell your stories, to be listened to, and to be known. And I didn't really think that I was maybe the best person to be doing this conversation or listening. But I was called upon that day. I learned that that day, I was called upon to be present, not perfect. And Addison and his mother set me on a path that day that really has been my entire career. And that is to help foster these kinds of conversations across what people feel is a divide where we have to be perfect. And to help healthcare people to feel more confident and comfortable in these conversations. So that is what I've dedicated myself to. What I'd like to do now is to fast forward a little bit and share with you a time in my life when I was a patient. And I want to invite every single one of you here in the audience to think of a time when you were a patient or someone in your life was a patient and to go there with me. It was a happy time in my life. I was pregnant for the third time. And my husband and I were very, very hopeful that this pregnancy was going to take. You see, we had suffered two miscarriages before this. But we still were hopeful that this one, yes, we're going to have a baby. 
So with this news, I went to the clinician, and I'm hoping that I'm going to hear the baby's heartbeat. It was very early, and the clinician said, look, it's OK. Don't worry about it. It's really early. We'll try again next week. So we tried again next week. Now this time, I didn't quite understand it, but there was something wrong with the battery and the Doppler machine. So they couldn't really hear the baby's heartbeat. So again, I leave the office thinking, uh-oh. And I'm starting, the fear is starting to creep up on me. I go for the third, the next week, for the third visit now. And again, now I'm really getting myself kind of worked up. And I'm worrying, uh-oh, is this going to happen again to me, to my husband? And I explained this to the clinician. And I said, I'm worried. I really feel like I need to hear the baby's heartbeat. We didn't hear it that time. I said, I really think I need an ultrasound. I'm worried. And she said, well, I'm not worried. And I said, but I am. And I said, please, I think I need this. And she said, well, OK. We'll order up an ultrasound for you. But I'm just going to put down because of maternal anxiety. I thought, I thought I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I thought, really? I mean, you, you, you really can't understand why I would be nervous, why I would be anxious? But I said, whatever. I just wanted the ultrasound. So OK, so I find myself within a couple of hours in the ultrasound suite, in that position, you know, in the hospital gown, flat on my back. And I am watching this radiology technician's face like a hawk. <laughs> right? You guys, you've been there, some of you. And it's absolutely expressionless. I can't tell good news, bad news. But I have to tell you, the longer I'm not getting any good news, just by virtue that I'm not getting good news, I'm, I'm starting to think the worst. So I say to her, I broke the silence. I said, can you tell me anything? I said, can, can you see my baby's heartbeat? I, is my baby OK? I'm kind of expecting, yeah, there's the heartbeat. There's a little arm. There's a little leg. And there was like none of that. And then she said those fateful words. She said, well, the doctor will call you with the results. She said, but there is one thing I can tell you. I said, really? What? Anything. And she said to me, I want you to know that you did a really great job filling up your bladder for the test. <laughs> and I thought to myself, really? And I thought, is this good news or bad news? And of course, Honestly, I knew it was bad news. Because I thought, if the best thing that is happening about today is that I could fill up my bladder, this is not good news. And in fact, over the telephone from a doctor who I didn't know, I found out that I had had my third miscarriage. And of course, I was heartbroken. I felt like a failure. The next morning, I found myself in an operating room. Now we're going to have the procedure. And I thought, OK, I was very nervous about this, very fearful. On the operating table, I see uh, like sort of a semicircle of, of uh, surgeons and nurses and all in their surgical scrub suits and their, and their caps. And I saw the clinician, the maternal anxiety clinician. And I so had hoped that she would come over to me and talk to me, maybe comfort me, tell me what to expect tell me maybe she was sorry for what I was going through. But that didn't happen. And I, I felt, I just felt at such a loss that I didn't have that opportunity. And I thought, how sad for her that she wasn't able to do that either. And again, it was a note to self about how important these conversations are. But I have to tell you, I had an anesthesiologist who was behind me. I never did see the man's face. But he put his hand on my shoulder. He squeezed my shoulder, and he talked to me in this left ear. And he said to me, I will be with you the whole time. He said, I will watch over you. And he said, we'll get you through this. I, those words sustained me, I have to tell you. The next thing I knew, I'm like strapped down like this. And I would say, hey, wait a second. Wait until the patient is sedated before you do that. It was really scary. I felt very fearful. There was a nurse on the left-hand side of me who said, give me your hand. You bet your life I took that hand and I squeezed it. It was a little strange because she had a glove on, uh, you know, and it felt a little plastic. But you know, it was a human hand, and it was warm. 
That was the other thing I remember. It was warm, and she squeezed it as hard as I was squeezing her. And the next thing I knew, I sort of, the medications did their work. I drifted off, and here I am talking to you. Those experiences really stayed with me. So what I'd like to do now is to, with that as backdrop, to really talk to you about a philosophy that I have come to with my colleagues. I like to think of it as the one-room schoolhouse. And in this one-room schoolhouse, we bring together physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, chaplains, medical interpreters. And we bring them together with patients and with family members. We leave our badges at the door, and we learn together about these kind of conversations, what matters. And I've learned from the families that years later, it isn't the medications or the surgeries, the treatments that they remember. What they really remember is the words that we said to them, our kindness that we extend, how we made them feel, and the way we treated them. That's what, that's what stays with people. That is the crucible of the whole experience. So this is what we learn in the One Room Schoolhouse. I have learned through my own training as not only a nurse but as a clinical psychologist. I mentioned a lot of doing, and so much of our experience and our training is focused on the technical aspects of care, the clinical excellence, which absolutely we all need. We all want. We expect that. But the one-room schoolhouse is about the other half of the medical equation. It's about the emotional standard of care. So I want to show you what happens inside of this one-room schoolhouse. On the left, uh, your right, my left, is one of our physicians, one of our learners. And she is actually with uh, two of our actors. We work with actors. They're really coached by our family members and our, and our patients. And she's getting the opportunity, in a way, to try this on for size, how to introduce herself. A lot of times in the hospital, people will say, hi, I'm GI. I'm renal. I'm cardiac. And you know, you got to start with where they're at. You know, not really. You know, you may be, I'm Dr. Elaine Meyer. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work here in the pediatric intensive care unit. So you start with wherever the person is at. So the way you introduce yourself, sitting down. When you sit down, even if you only have five minutes, it seems like so much better. It's of higher quality. This doesn't have to be about a healthcare conversation. This is a conversation in life that's important, right? Just sit down. Lean into it, as you can see. She's touching this person. Now, there's something happening here. This could be any kind of a difficult conversation. It could be about a new diagnosis. It could be that maybe they're hearing about a miscarriage. They could be hearing about a medical error, where this clinician might be talking to them, apologizing to them. We're talking to them about what we're going to do to make this right, to help make this situation whole again. So this is the kind of thing that happens inside of the one-room schoolhouse. The other thing in the one-room schoolhouse is that practice makes better. Practice doesn't make perfect, especially in this art form of conversation like this. Again, being called upon to be present, not perfect. You all know these guys, right? This is like one of the best mnemonics, because everybody knows the Wizard of Oz, all right? And so what, ha what are the ingredients of these kind of difficult conversations? What I'd like to do is share with you a way that I like to think about them. Remember the lion? He was after courage. So what I would say to you is never, ever underestimate the power of your courage, your leadership, your willingness to go there with a patient, with a loved one, this is not just about healthcare conversations. This is in life, all right? Uh, Carl Rogers, the great psychotherapist, teaches us that one anxious person in the room is enough. You know what that means? That you have to be that non-anxious person, that calm, non-anxious person, or to try to be. Again, just as I did with Addison's mother, I sat down and I listened. I did the best I could, OK? What about Scarecrow? What was he after, remember? He wanted brain. So this would be the information that you have to share, the knowledge, your clinical experience, your wisdom, OK? Very important. If you were newly diagnosed with prostate cancer or diabetes, you certainly would want a clinician in front of you that could explain what was happening in terms that you could understand it, 
that wouldn't scare you, that wouldn't frighten you, that would help you feel like, I can get through this. We can get through this. You know, just a little example, I work with a lot of kids, and sometimes we may say things like, uh, you know, we're going to put you on a stretcher. Well, a kid may say, ouch, you know, I stretch, I don't want to be stretched, right? Um, you may not, and so this is the scarecrow part that we learn about, our word choice. So I might say to that child, instead of, I'm going to put you on a stretcher, right? I may say something like, look, we're going to put you on a little bed that has wheels, and then we'll be able to take you where you need to go, all right? So that's the brains, the word choice, okay? And what about Tin Man? Remember what he was, uh, went to Oz for? Heart. The heart is this, the little kindnesses that we can extend every day, the compassion, the mercy that we can show people, especially people who are hurting or suffering or ill. Okay? Maya Angelou, the great American poet, teaches us that in order to survive, a human being needs to live in a home furnished with hope. So many of these conversations are about hope. They're about learning to sort of just ask a question like, what's on your mind? What's worrying you? How can I be helpful? What are you hoping for? You get the idea. What I'd like to do is share with you just a really brief story about how this all came together for what I would call a very reluctant learner to the One Room Schoolhouse. This was a clinician who really didn't want to have these conversations at all. He had joined the emergency medical transport team. So he just thought, well, wow, I'm just going to bypass having these conversations altogether. I'm not with people very long, all right? Well, it was a good plan, but it didn't quite work that way. And after he had spent some time with us in the one room schoolhouse, what he was called on uh, an emergency transport to an emergency room with a 14-day-old baby girl. The rest of the team rushed over to the baby girl, and out of the corner of his eye, he saw the father at the foot of the baby's bed. And he was saying, come on, little lady. Come on, little lady. And the mother was in the corner of the room crying, alone. And he said sort of effortlessly, he found himself walking in that direction. He said, I just couldn't believe that I felt like I could do this. And then the next thing he did was he knelt down next to the mother, and he took her hand. He didn't sit, he didn't stoop, he knelt. He realized that this was sacred space. And he went on to explain to that family what was happening to their baby girl who unfortunately had severe dehydration and was having a cardiac arrest. It was extremely scary. And that family thanked him and the team afterwards. And he said, well, I didn't do anything. The team did everything. And they said, oh, no, you helped us through this. So many times people sort of naturally devalue the conversations that we have and think it's all about you know, the procedures and the actions. And he learned that day that it was really about being present, not perfect and to going there with the patient. So coming full circle here, what I'd like to do is to share with you a piece of my <laughs> inspiration. That's a lot younger me, and that's my little boy. And all I have to do is think about him and all the people who helped bring him into the world. And I've got my inspiration to know why these conversations matter and to keep having them in my world, in my, in my work. And I encourage every single one of you that's sitting in these seats today or listening to this to dig deep, find your taproot, find your inspiration, so that you too can have these kind of conversations with people who you're taking care of and that you love. And I'd like to give and close with just my, this last message for you. Once upon a time, you wanted to change the world. And I want to tell you that you still can, one conversation at a time. Thank you.